instance, this is about morality. We accept that you have the freedom to be massively racist if you want to, but we're going to do our best in education to convince you that you should not be. Um, that is one of many ways in which you could define what is, admittedly, an extremely vague motion. And when motions are extremely vague, you have a lot of choices. Was it? Not the EU, so not European University debating Sanderson. Last year's EUDC was about the genetic engineering. Hang on, EUDC or AUDC? I'm not really sure. I don't want to hear It was a final somewhere. It, it was a final somewhere. Well. Well, for finals, people often give more open motions because they expect teams to be able to handle them better. The yeah. first round of EUDC last year was this house believes that schools should teach morals above obedience to the law or something like yeah. that. Yeah, and that makes it clear what they're going for there, right? In that case, they're talking about specifically the idea that the school should encourage behaviours over and above obedience to the laws. And that would be one way of defining it, and then you'd have to specify what those behaviours would be. But it would be up to you. Um, there's any number of ways you could run it. My mind goes immediately to sex. Um, but, yeah. So far, so predictable. Uh, shall I move on? Shall I move on? Or are there any burning questions? We're running out of time. Okay. Argument generation. This is the other panic moment, right? Um, we must have some arguments. X is an argument. Therefore, we shall argue X. Um, appears to be the mode of reasoning of all sorts of people when they encounter first prop, right? Any old material, throw it down, doesn't matter, don't think about it, just say it, go, 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 go. Stop. Um, the way to think about what material in first prop should be, particularly in the first prop speech, first prop is a little bit like a preemptive summary, right? Uh, has anyone heard this thought before? Someone at the back is nodding. Um, what does that mean? In a first prop speech, one of the nice things you can do is stand up and go, this is a debate about this. Bang. This is what we're going to do. Definition. Because of this, right, right, because this is the thing we're doing, in order to convince you that that's a good thing, we would have to convince you of three things. One, two, three. If we can convince, insofar as we can convince you of those three things, we have won this debate. I will now talk about these three things. Um, so what's happening there is that after the opening -y bit, what your arguments are um, is you articulate and then fulfill the burden of proof. The burden of proof being the set of things that need to be true in order for you to win. And you've noticed I've thrown them all into the first speech. More and more I've done that later. Um, so the burden of proof, the things that need to be true in order for you to win this debate, that is a technique for prep what needs to be true, but it is also a technique for the presentation of your material. Why? Because it does two things. Firstly, it makes sure that everything you are saying is relevant, and it makes sure that you have not missed any crucial bit of your burden of proof. Right? So it guarantees that you're not missing anything, and it guarantees that you're not wasting your time. Um, and if you put all of that in your first prop speech, you can make it transparently clear that you are doing your job, and also, you can make life pretty difficult for second prop. Because if you fulfill your burden of proof, ultimately anything second prop are adding is like fluff. Okay? Now, burdens of proof in debating are almost always exactly the same. Um, we overcomplicate what you need to argue in a debate as well. The burden of proof is almost identical in 99% of debates. To say that the prop is winning, or has won, is simply to say that we can do it and we should do it. Or if you prefer, it works, and it's justified. That's it. If you can show me that this thing can be done and should be done, it seems difficult to understand what other arguments need to be advanced. Right? And if in prep you go, well, like, yeah, it seems that we've given sufficient detail here as to this can be done, and often it'll be very easy to show that something can be done. If, for example, you were to ban advertising, this has a ban advertising. Banning advertising seems pretty easy to do, right? So the huge crux of that debate will be, should it be done? Should it be the case that we should ban it? And then you have to articulate why something should be done, why this is the sorts of thing the state should do, um, why this is compatible with the way we think about rights, or why this is compatible with the way we think about democracy, or whatever. Um, but the burden of proof should guide you, and it should mean that when you're prepping material, you like, look through it and go, have we missed anything? Is there a crucial part of what we're supposed to be saying that we haven't given yet? And also, does this point add anything? Is it nice but ultimately irrelevant? Um, and insofar as you can think of things in terms of the burden of proof, 
what, when you're prepping and also when you're presenting information, it makes it much, much harder for you to be screwed by second proposition. Uh, the reason why you put... The reason, why, so the reason why that's all in the first speech, so this is what I call front-loading. When I used to debate with James, a South African, we would spend the 15 minutes of prep writing my speech. And that was the first speech. We would spend zero minutes writing the second speech, which is, makes sense, speaking second fun. Um, the reason why you do that is that if you've satisfied and fulfilled your burden of proof, which is to say you've set out the core of the case analytically and you've defined the motion pretty well, like, there's not much more you can do to beat either of the teams on the bottom half. Right? But if you put everything you've prepped in making the first speech perfect, as good as you can possibly make it, you have seven minutes to shred first opposition in detail, to actually take, through, take us through everything they have said. Um, and don't make it look like a rebuttal speech. Steal their structure. Stand up and go, well, yeah, the first opposition speaker spoke about these two things, and it's somewhat convenient, therefore, that I'm also going to speak about these two things. Right? Make it look like substantive material, obviously, but it means that you have huge amounts of time to deal with first off, because that's the only thing you can really do beyond that point. You can't hit second prop. You can't really hit second op, although I'll talk about points of information in my final three minutes. Um, and you may not want to throw all of your material into the first speech. That might just not be possible. You might generate too much of it. Fine, fair enough. But the idea that the first speech is what you should spend most of your prep time on, and you shouldn't worry if there's loads of free time in the second speech, enables you to really bring the battle to first op. And that, again, is the other crucial bit of your role fulfillment. So play around with that. It's also more fun. Um, more time for a bottle. More time to like, you know, really, really kill people. Um, Final point, uh, yes. Two questions. Yes. First of all, uh, assuming if I stand up and say, okay, in order to win this debate, proposition has two main burdens, I'm going to prove to you in my first speech. Aren't I kind of declaring my second speaker mostly irrelevant? If I've proven everything proposition needs to be proven in the first speech. Uh, absolutely not. Um, because it may, of course, be the case that your sec second speaker, given the challenges brought by first opposition, is going to develop, substantiate, enlarge upon. Um, of course your second speaker is not irrelevant. Well, um, of course I was not. once told this in a, in a feedback. So say Bad my, judges are a part, fact of life. Second <laughs> speaker will expand on these burdens. But like, if we were assassinating Robert Mugabe, one of the things you might want to stand up and go, Robert Mugabe, why not? Oh, well, let's do someone else, someone else. Who else would you like to assassinate? Quickly, quickly. Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro. He's pretty much gone. <laughs> someone else. Castro's their brother. Ahmadinejad. Ahmadinejad. Yeah, okay. Let's kill Ahmadinejad. Um, you could stand up and go, I'm going to talk about two things. The first thing I'm going to talk about is why he deserves to die. And the second thing I'm going to talk about is why we can kill him. And it seems that you have proved that this is a thing that should be done and a thing that can be done. Your second speaker can then, to, to like, can then develop a speech that explains why the world will not explode if the IDF kill, uh, kill Mohamed Ahmadinejad, which would be useful material. <laughs> okay. Yeah, which is again useful material. So despite the fact that you have articulated and fulfilled a burden of proof in the first speech, right, the opposition will open up different fronts of attack, um, including what imagines in this debate, the world will explode. Because um, it would. Um, and then you can. You, uh, you reckon that, yeah, they'll never find out who did it. <laughs> it can be very secret. First off, how will you make it secret? We defined it as secret. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The Norishman came, oh, I came through the airport. <laughs> they photocopied my passport as well. Oh no. Um, but I think that's fair enough. What was question two? Uh, when you say that the two burdens are usually or always, you know, it works and it's justified, should we explain that the burdens that we're proving are, you know, that it works or it's justified, or, you know, explain it somehow that it doesn't sound like we're using the two generic terms? Well, sometimes it'll be a bit clunky. Um, sometimes, though, like, Sometimes that is just the most natural way of expressing what you're saying anyway. Like, I wouldn't worry about whether or not your language is generic. Um, as long as your argument isn't. Like, like I, I, I struggle to think of the judge who was going to be like, well, they were great, but generic description of the points. <laughs> um, I struggle to think of the, like, the person for whom, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't lose sleep over that. I really wouldn't. 
Final thought is a point of information because people want to, you know, go get their cigarettes and things. Um, well, I do. Points of information. There are general rules about how to use points of information in debates, um, which you may or may not know, and if not, then yeah, we can tell you them later. But when you are in first prop points of information are particularly important because they are all you have beyond the top, beyond the first three speeches. You should make sure that you use your points of information to make sure your material stays relevant. If there is a huge, long, totally new opposition extension, it is unlikely that you can rebut it significantly in one point of information. What you can do in a point of information, usually, is force second opposition to deal with a bit of your case that they've forgotten about. You can highlight, you can keep the debate on your terms, you can drag the debate back to the issues that you thought were central. That's very well, but we told you six speeches ago, this, why is that wrong? in its most simple form, but making sure that you stay on your issues. And also, if any crucial punches are landed on your material, you will need to use a point of information to like, do a little bit of defense on that. You need to work out a way to do that in one sentence, which is tough. That's why everyone should write points of information down. How many people in this room write points of information down? Everyone should write points of information down. Firstly, your partner may not be thinking of as many as you. They may need to be offering points of information. Um, secondly, you can spend three speeches, crossing out a word and replacing it with a different word, changing the verbs around, having a slightly nastier no, verb, well, that's just you. thinking of a slightly better example. And then you can stand up and the point of information is like a brick through the windscreen of their speech, um, which is what a point of information should be. Uh, so everyone should be writing them down, and that's another way to make sure that your points of information are helping your case. Right? People often use points of information just to generically criticize what the other side is saying. That is a waste of time. <laughs> use the point of information to answer crucial criticisms that have been made of you and to point and to bring the debate back to your material. Can I add a Go for it. If you're a Prime Minister... This is an ad, by the way. <laughs> they know me. God uh, Empress of Israel. Uh, quick piece of advice. When you're a Prime Minister, take both your points of information from the closing opposition. You're going to hear first ops case in their speech. You're going to be able to handle it. But if you want your second speaker to be able to at least do a bit of preemptive rebuttal, a good way of doing that is by taking points of information from the closing opposition team. This way you kind of know where the debate's going to have. You are able to preemptively make a point about what those issues are. It's also, that's happened to me when I've been speaking second in first prop. So the point of information has gone over from third. Like, my partner has answered it, and has answered it reasonably well, but then based on that I'm like, oh, they're running a point about that. Great. Two minutes of material on that issue in my speech. So I can preemptively shit on them. Um, which again is fun when you look at their faces. Uh, I think we've run out of time. Yeah.